Hi, this is Film Talk Weekly. I'm here with Chuck O'Brien. We're in Denver, Colorado. It's about 70, I'm going to guess 77 degrees feels feels like. Oh, it's not 76. It's 77 okay. degrees. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I that think... is Denver. Oh, this, wait a minute, that this is Denver, Denver behind us. Yeah. Beautiful and night. We're, we're here at the O'Brien Studios. And uh Yes, yeah, so we even have a crew tonight behind yeah, the camera is Eileen she, O'Brien. Yeah. And uh, she's been working on the sets, the lights, the makeup. 35 years of experience. I mean, if this doesn't look good, it's her fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are here with Chuck O'Brien. How many years in film? Well, I, I think it's about 35 years. Um I, I actually started kind of late. I was 33 when I started. Oh, wow. Which okay. is a little bit of a story. I, I you know, I, I kind of sowed a lot of wild oats before that time and, and had a lot of things. So um, that part of my story, we won't even go to because it's not pertinent to film. But I did. The thing was, I spent many years trying to say, what is worth doing? And I'm sort of a natural philosopher. And I did want to do something that contributed, had a bad effect on society or anything. So I kept saying all the time. Thank you. Yeah. What, what was I going to do? Thank you for not. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So <laughs> one night I was watching the Olympics, actually, on television. Ah. And uh, they had, uh, they were doing the ski jump. And, and I thought, you know, the cameraman standing out there in that snow, I could do that. That would be a, you know, okay. Uh-huh. I mean, who's that going to hurt? And yeah. uh, so I said that that's what I would do. And I, so I went to San Francisco because it was, had the best uh, school for television oh, really? production. Yeah. Zettel was the uh, professor there that wrote the main book on television production. At what time. school? And this was uh, in, in San Francisco State University. Okay. And, uh, so I wanted to go there, and previously I'd always been able to talk myself into any school. I'd gone to six universities, and that, you know, because I came from the European tradition of not thinking that you go to school to get a job, but you go to school to enhance yourself. And so I kept going to different schools because I, like I wanted to be a philosophy. writer, philosopher type, and and everything. And uh, so I was able to talk myself into it. Like I remember when I went for journalism in, in Cal State Long Beach. He had to be interviewed by the head of the department and and throw so one in and he and it was right after Watergate and he said you know what brings you here uh, Woodward and Bernstein and I said no actually Carrollton and Hemingway mm-hmm. and he oh. said you're in interesting <laughs> so I got in so I thought I could talk my way in uh, to Zettel's classes and everything but uh, lo and behold it was there was everybody in the world wanted to go there and mm. I didn't have enough credential or enough ability to get it. So I went back to Boston mm-hmm. and I was broke and living in my car and I got busted for vagrancy and went before a judge and the judge said, why are you vagrant? You've got six years of college. Right. And I said, well, nobody really wants to hire a philosopher, you know, <laughs> and I wanted to be a writer, but I don't have the talent that, that I have the taste for. So, uh, you know, uh, anyway, so he said, well, what would you do if you had the education to do it? And I said, well, I, I was watching TV and, and I thought, you know, I could be a cameraman. I could be in television. So he said, well, we're going to make a deal with you. If you work for six months for the city, we'll pay for six months for you to go and specifically learn television. How do they do stuff like this now? Well, I mean, they it was it actually well. a Jimmy Carter program oh. called CETA. And most people were abusing it, but I actually made it work. Yeah. Uh, and just to jump ahead real fast, um, three and a half years after being homeless and busted for being homeless, I was running two departments at NBC in New York. So that six-month intensive program worked for me. I uh-huh. worked very hard at it, but I loved it. And uh, so that's how I got in. I went to a, uh, it was called Graham Junior College, and the Classes were all taught by working professionals in the television industry in Boston, and uh, and we had everything. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we had studios and we had remote cameras, but we also had a lot of academics. You mm-hmm. know, to, to uh, had, learn broadcast law and uh, you know and and do, do a lot of writing. I, 
you know, wrote sitcoms, they wrote uh, commercials, um, you know, news, everything, you know, and so we had to do everything. And we had to do it. And it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a good program. Is it still there, the school? I think so. The only other person I've ever heard of that graduated from there was, uh, uh, I don't get the, was it yeah. Andy, uh, Andy Kaufman. Oh. So as you can maybe deduce, they only turned out bizarre graduates. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I went there. And when I graduated there after the, the six months, to get into the industry, uh, I went immediately down to South Carolina. Because I'd heard that in South Carolina ETV, they didn't have unions and you could do anything. Okay. And so I figured, okay, I get the experience. Well, it took me another uh, about five months to finally get a job there. And uh, uh, but I did get ETV a job and and immediately started working on the as a cameraman and everything. And uh, probably the the most significant thing that happened there was I met Eileen, my wife. Yes. But anyway, so I was 33 years old. I guess that's what I was trying to say. But at South Carolina ETV, and for uh, really was a wonderful thing because you, I did get to do a lot of things. That, you know, I, I got to not only be a cameraman, I, I got to be a, a technical director. Now, what I wanted to do, the whole reason I went in was to be a, a writer and director. Okay. And uh, and I was working toward that, but I had to go and, and get a back operation. And while I was in there, Eileen was telling our bosses, well, he can't come right back out, you know, so we got to find something else for him to do. So they said, well, can he edit? And it never occurred to me to be an editor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm laying in a hospital bed, still recovering, and they bring in. Now, in those days, we had three quarter inch. Uh, which was, you know, recording. It, it, it was kind of a crude recording, though it was the industry standard up to that point. But that, and uh, so they brought in the three quarter inch decks, and and they told me to uh, edit this um, driver's education show to see if I even knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And um, apparently, I did pretty well because the director from when the came hospital bed? from the hospital bed. Okay. And so uh, the director, when he saw what. I was doing the only direction I've ever gotten in editing, and it really meant a lot to me, is he looked at in the background, uh, at one point, this car was going by, and I cut before it had finished crossing the street. And, and the director said, no, watch all the movement and let it complete, because it, it bothers the yacht. And uh, uh -huh, and that, that little point helped me a lot, uh -huh. but I did learn to be very aware of everything in the picture. And and uh, you know make my selections and tell my story. And it turned out because I wanted to be a writer all my life, and I was a pretty good storyteller. And uh, so I got yeah. into editing. And the fortunate thing about that was a new there was had just been a revolution in editing. Now this is going to be technical, and this is why for the kids I, out there. And I, so I'm going to jump ahead again and just tell you that. Years later, when we were in New York, Eileen and I, we used to say that we lived on my salary and dined out on her stories <laughs> because her stories are very interesting. She stayed in production and I got I into the technical about part. You that you're not even going to cover here. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. like what? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, just some background before Chuck went to before he was a vagrant and went <laughs> went back to school. I think Chuck was living in an airplane I on an island. I, I, and <laughs> Uh, I heard that he only left because and came back because he loved television. Well, there, there's some. We're going to take a quick break yeah. and okay. not give Chuck a chance it's to re respond. That. That's the truth. And uh, we're going to okay. take a quick break for these messages. We'll be right back. This is Film Talk Weekly. I'm your guest host, Castle Cersei, with the Santa Fe International Film Festival, and I'm and here with I'm your imposter uh, interview interviewee. Okay. Film. Giant. Giant, yes. Chuck O'Brien. What what do you want your title to be? What do you career film maker, film uh, editor? I don't know. Television. You need to uh, sum up your whole life in a couple seconds right now. Post production. Post production I, manager. Yes. Uh, that, okay. Cut. That's right. Uh, okay. Are we back and talking again? Maybe. Okay. Right, let's let's just be back. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and we're back. Oh, and we're back. Okay. An interesting thing about the daytime talk 
thing is when I was in the hospital that time, and, and um, David Letterman often talks about his daytime talk show as a failure. Well, I was I in the hospital. He did, and and it lasted, I think, about three months, Love which was the length of time that I was in the hospital because I got an infection in my spinal column. The whole thing was a mess. But I did watch every one of his shows, oh. and I think that that I should have gotten some special mention later on because I also worked on his show when we got to New York. Okay. I mean, not like Eileen, who was doing cue cards and like that, but I got to do stupid pet tricks with the tape machine, and I did the slow mo of stupid pet really? tricks. Yes, and then I was also an editor. Um, and the probably the most interesting story about editing his show was so important. Oh, it was. It was. It was so much fun. Yes. It was really fun. Yeah. Um, but also as an editor, he would do these segments from time to time with Connie Chung. Okay. And whenever he would go out and they'd shoot that and they'd bring it back to the edit room, we had to unplug everything so it could not be seen anywhere else in NBC. We were doing it, and and I'm going to get in trouble for saying it, but Connie Chung was a potty mouth. And oh. <laughs> so we had to edit around that. And, you know, wow. and, but of course, you know, Letterman loved it and had a lot of fun. But so those are my two Letterman stories. Plus, I saw Wait, all what? of this. Did you have to unplug things? What so that it, nobody else recorded it. And, you know, at NBC, you never knew who was recording what, and everything oh. was on the grid, and you could pull anything up and, oh. and all like that. So okay. there was no real, you know, privacy anywhere. But we had this stipulation with Connie Chung that nobody would see anything until after we had gone in the edit room and cleaned it up. Okay. And, and it was always okay. very interesting. And, and uh, another little thing about Connie Chung is when I was studying journalism, uh, I, Connie Chung came to uh, L.A., uh, and I interviewed her as one of my journalism things. So, so I have a little free history with her as well. So I, anyway. Run-ins with... And you didn't... That, yeah. Eileen didn't know this. Eileen is... In addition to um, being our crew, our grip, our lighting, yeah, our, yeah. what are the other terms? She, like, she's just uh, pretty much keeping us on base. One man, one woman. She is a one um, woman. You know, she, she's, she's also she's, our studio audience. She, she's yes. an unstoppable force. Yes. And I can't believe I'm still talking because I was going to say to you from the beginning, one of the reasons I wasn't a, didn't turn out to be the writer I wanted to be is I'm not a natural storyteller. Eileen is a rock and tour, world class. Yes. I can tell I the same that. thing that that's she'll tell this part. long story, and I would say it in two sentences. Uh -huh. That really doesn't hold an audience long. So mm -hmm. that, that was a primary difference in our yes. talent. Uh, you know, um, but anyway, so where are Oh, the airplane. Yeah, you're living on an island when I, an airplane. It was the 60s, okay? And, <laughs> and oh, I was in Austin, crazy. Texas, and we were doing a lot of things though somewhat legal now, were not at all legal then. And But I was wanting to have a counterculture and start a new world and do I was very idealistic. As soon as something that wasn't highly idealistic and you know, that occurred, I said, I'm leaving. And yeah. I took um, about 50 bucks, I guess it was. And, and we had you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. We were rich hippies. Uh -huh. And I went to this little island that I'd heard about from people in the Peace Corps called San Andres, and I lived on the beach in a, a cockpit of an airplane and uh, uh, was there for about six months. And the reason I came back sort of was that I missed TV, <laughs> but it was also that I couldn't even get a Time magazine. I didn't know what was happening in the rest of the world, which was sort of the point, but... I didn't have the endurance. I was too much a, a child of the 20th century and, and wanted to know what the, how the rest of the world Did was passing like itself up. Did they have a restaurant or a bar? Or no, they, they, had, like... they had two hotels. Okay. And I made my living while I was there teaching English to the natives so that they could work in the oh. hotels. And the reason they had the hotels there, the, the island was three miles by 10 miles. And the runway, when you land, the only airplane that flew there was Sasa Airline, which we call Stay at Home, Stay Alive Airline. And, <laughs> and the pilots would make bets with each other about how many times they would skip on this runway coming in. Uh -huh. and, it, well, like, and the reason I was living in the cockpit is there were several of them that had been dragged out because there was so much 
contraband going in and out of that island. Uh -huh. And that's why the hotels were there, because the Colombian middle class would come there to buy their appliances and, and high-end stuff and not have to pay a tariff or taxes. And so they would come have a week on the beach and buy this stuff. And so and there was a couple a of... fridge in the plane and fly it back? Oh, no. I mean, they would bring all this... All the, you know, like a plane would come in full of refrigerators and, and all this stuff. And so people would come and buy this stuff. And uh, then uh, they would, yeah, they would fly. And they'd take a fridge, I, yeah, like it a was stove crazy. back on the plane. It was the 60s. Huh. What can I say? Yeah. We're trying to beat beat the taxes. Yeah. Yeah. And it made the it made the island. And that was the economy. And I and I taught them, I taught English. And the people, the natives here spoke a combination of English, French, Spanish, um, and, and I don't know what else. It was a, a very strange island. Its only claim to fame was there was one year when it was the leading uh, producer of coconuts. Uh, and I, I count myself amongst them. Anyway. So anyway, I was there for six months. And then uh, I, I went back um, to the United States and, and I, I went to, uh, actually, I went to Boston and worked. One of my real loves in life is tennis. I learned it in college. And uh, in Boston, there were the best lawn tennis courts in the country. Okay. The, the Longwood Cricket Club, mm -hmm. you know, the, it was the Boston Brahmins, the, the Kennedys, et cetera, played there. I worked on the ground crew, and I kept the, the lawn tennis courts, and I loved it. There was no money in it. Mm -hmm. I, I had like a $5 budget per day to, for food, transportation, everything, but I was hooked on doing it. Sort of like Eileen got hooked on cue cards, you know, with all of her experience and everything she did, she was cue cards for Saturday Night Live. And finally, I said to her at one point, you're not really advancing your career. I didn't realize at that time that maybe it's better you just have fun in your career yeah. rather than advance it. So, you you know, yeah. I used to say that the, That's the biggest I mistake I made in television was not being a cameraman anymore because then I had to get serious. And when we were in New York and I, I went there and it was an editor and everything, um, ultimately they made me a, ma a manager because I understood what everything was necessary and I understood the, the talent, but also I was kind of a conduit between engineers and production. Oh, I'd worked okay. in production. I was no engineer, but I could, the way I had to explain things to myself, I could explain it to others. You could speak the and language. that's why ultimately yeah. years later, I became one of the first people with Avid. And Avid was the second revolution. The first one I never even got to, CMX. But I, Avid was the second one. And that needed people to go around and explain to editors all over and, and to producers the, what digital television was. Because what, what, you know, we'd had analog television, and that was such a laborious way to edit. And when, So for the kids out there that for, don't okay. know analog analog and like was, was, what editing was like before you well walked. here's the deal that the the pictures used to be 30 frames a second so in, in one second 30 frames on but film on on so. videotape oh videotape okay. and, okay. yeah and so what happened is the 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 gun that sh that made the picture would shoot actually 60 times in one second, back and forth, because it had to inter interlace them, right? So there was blanking. There's, you know, here's the picture, and then here's the, it stops the picture, and, right. and it's all in there, and if you edit at the wrong place, you've got blanking showing, or horizontal, you know, uh, showing, and all those problems existed, along with all the problems of editing. But the main problem was, Unlike film, where film, you cut it and you put it in, you move everything else down. In video, if you changed your mind, you had to then repeat every edit you made downstream of that one because you had to lay that one in and then redo all the others. Do you do this by hand in the old days? Like Sort of. Actually, in the very beginning, when it was just two-inch tape, uh -huh. they had a solution that they had to put on and a, and a microscope type thing to find the the pulse on the control track and and then they would mark that and roll the tape back five seconds and hit it and then make the edit in five seconds and then it would be on the right spot otherwise the picture would roll and everything so it was sort of by hand but then it was just machine to machine but it was very crude and then they invented insert editing and insert, we're gonna get 
We're, we're going to come back. Dig to into it. Okay. Yeah. Let's. All right. See. We're going to take a quick break. If everybody for isn't asleep already. These messages. <laughs> um, this is Castle with Film Talk Weekly from the Santa Fe International Film Festival. I don't know if we need that. I mean, uh, I, I think I'm going to record it's my. There. It's a. It's an opportunity. Yes. Okay. If, if we're right on time, we don't need it. You know. Okay. Do you need more water? No, I'm good. You're good. Thank you. Do you need some? I'll have some more tea. Uh, tea. Okay. Are we back? Should I just talk? We're back. Okay. Yeah, and we're um, back. And and once again, for those of you that are going to be late coming back, I'll just finish the technical thing. Basically, videotape was analog at first, which basically recorded the picture. In the very beginning, you had to actually, what they call, flip the mirror. So from the so that the image coming from the camera on the floor would then flip and shine into a film camera. And that was the only way that they could preserve. So when they mm -hmm. finally advanced beyond that, they got two inch, two inch had four heads recording the picture. What and, year was that? Was, was, um, that was that? probably in the early 60s. Okay. And then in the, toward the middle of the 60s and then mid 60s, was three quarter inch, and that was what they called slant track. And so the head would go, take longer, a, a longer piece of the tape that was going by, so it could get the whole picture. But then the big development came one inch, and one inch, you know, basically you you could stop it, you could slow mo it, you could do a lot of things where it was wonderful. And that was what when CMX also then came in. And CMX laid down on the videotape a time code, which was an electronic sound sounding, and it was every second. And, and that number was laid down, and it was a continuous track. And then you could insert edit so that you could put pictures on it at any point that you wanted to. Mm -hmm. But once again, still, if you had just edited, let's say, a minute-long piece, and you said, no, we should have used two shots in the middle, you'd still have to go back and repeat all those edits afterwards, you know, because you couldn't push them down. But at least you didn't have to, you know, connect it with, with the control track editing. So it's all very testable and everything. But it was a big advance in CMX. And CMX was a computer that would hold, would grab all the, the tape machines that you were rolling and all the effects machines and the switcher, which is where you do transitions and everything like that. And it would control them on, you tell it what you wanted to do it, and it would do it, and you could see it, and it was there, and you could either keep that or change it or whatever. So it was a lot faster, but still much slower than editing film, which was really just cut, cut. But, you know, you'd have a, with film, you have a negative. You should, you don't ever cut your negative. That's your original stuff. But uh -huh. you'd make work prints from okay. that and they have edge numbers in film so that then right, when they right. cut and, uh you know I've you could know those. where you're putting this and you had all these strips hanging in a bin and all of them. Mm -hmm. well what happened is it was the guy i worked for when i left nbc and i went to abbott invented the way to convert the analog picture the the straight picture into digital binary information which okay. is what we still do, so much of what we do. Okay. Right? And with that, you could move anything anywhere because it was all just, it was like word processing. Uh -huh. You know, word processing, you stick a, a word in here, do this, do that. Right. And the same thing then with picture. Okay. And you, so you could do it real fast. Avid was the first company that really accomplished that. Mm -hmm. Other companies were trying it. They were like there was one where you'd wind up 10 tapes and you'd cue each one at the place you wanted to, so you could show 10 cuts, you know, and, go, blah, and you blah, 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 rewind, blah, blah, blah. it was a lot of noise and a lot of, a lot of problems yeah. and everything like that. And, and also on analog tapes, the more you make copies of things, the less resolution, the picture got worse, softer, well, makes, softer and all that. That makes sense. All that. Yeah. So anyway, all that's the boring stuff. Let's talk a little bit more about television. Well, I mean, so, well, I mean what do you okay. think of like that you can do with this on your iPhone now? Yeah, well, and, oh, and I, also, I also heard that you like I invented you invented the iPhone. I invented the iPhone yeah. and I invented um, uh, did you ever a Final Cut Pro? So, yeah, when I was working for Avid, edit movies on a phone. No, no, yeah. when, I, when I was editing in New York, mm -hmm. 
the edit rooms cost more than a million dollars to do it. You had to also have an engineer, and it cost about two thousand dollars an hour to sit in the room with me and edit, and it was a slow process. Now, what we could do there for all that money and the engineers and all that anybody can do on their phone right now, and and yeah. that's that's how much things have changed. What do you think of that? What do I think of that? Yeah, I think it's just absolutely miraculous. I think it's wonderful. Um, and you know, it. it one of the phrases that I gave when I was with IMIX that I wanted to use in marketing because I was head of marketing, but they were afraid to, to I, I wanted to say it's, it's editing at the speed of thought. And that basically. That makes sense to me as a graphic designer. Yeah, it just changed yeah. everything so much. Mm -hmm. There was so much engineering behind it all, but the convenience is so much. Now, you know, I mean, like when I first went with Avid, I had to learn what a Macintosh was. At NBC, all we had was Wangs, which were word processors. That's okay. A, you know, and and everybody, when those came out, everybody went crazy until finally a vice huh. president told everybody, "Get off your Wang and go back into your apartment and manage." You know, so <laughs> and if, you know, but because everybody was, "Oh, look at this! Look at this! I can write memo after memo." Yeah, you know? how exciting! And, and, you know, but yeah. uh, anyway, so it, it you know everything kept changing all along the way. So just to kind of trying to crunch the story. Eileen and I got married within a month of knowing each other at ETV, and within a year, we went to New York together and, uh, and started working there. And I worked first at ABC and then at NBC, and I started off in videotape and, and then CMX editing, and uh, and then all, and, but those were vacation relief jobs. The, uh, you know, it's all union and everything, and the union would hire somebody, and you could last about a year and a half because you were filling in vacation time on people otherwise. But after that, you're out. And so NBC came to me and said, well, we'd like you to manage the department. And and I needed you know, And this is pre-AVID. Th this is pre-AVID, right. Yeah. So then I, I became manager of uh, uh, first videotape operations and commercials, you know, all the commercials, making the commercials, playing the commercials, playing everything to air, but recording all the programs and all that sort of thing. And then... I became the manager of post-production because I knew so much about post-production mm -hmm. and, and I did all of that for the longest time. And uh, I mean, what were you thinking when this was, first of all, why did you move to New York? Why did, why for did your move job? To New York? Or, yeah. I, like, and, um, I think they'd grown up in New York and, and really loved it and wanted to go back. Mm -hmm. And my intention in going to South Carolina was to get the experience to allow me to work, you know, because everybody wants to work on the best shows they can. Mm -hmm. And because I'd learned CMX when it first came out, I had a little ticket to New York because there was only about three people in New York to edit CMX. Okay. Because South Carolina TV was so wealthy, they were one of the first ones to buy that equipment. Now, Eileen told me why South Carolina TV was... Yeah, they, they, had they so basically... Much funding. I think they had, they had about five stations. And, and they combined would broadcast more in, in one day than ABC, NBC, and CBS combined. They, they, because they were making programs for the school. Also, they were making programs for PBS. They were all PBS affiliates. But also, we were state employees. And the reason we were state employees is it was started in order to supplement uh, the not having to segregate the schools so they could say e separate but equal. They're all getting this great television education so I just and think so we were just you know and so we had a big staff we were busy we had yeah. money we were some you know we're, we were so you got to learn. By, the, by, yeah. the, by the senate we were state employees and we you know we just did everything and pbs loved to come down because we were cheap we had all the equipment we had experienced people and we charged almost nothing because the state so, so you had the state so funding had, yeah. you getting you all the best equipment also, they didn't have to integrate schools and could show the, That's right. the best and, of and, and public education. And we got education. to work on all that, which is basic. It's like getting a master's degree. Uh -huh. But also, and I did a lot of dance in America and all this stuff. Uh -huh. And that was so much fun and so great. And, you know, then you turn on PBS in prime time and there you are, even though you're working in South Carolina. Yeah. So, but because I had that experience, I had it. 
sort of a ticket to New York. It wasn't easy. I still had to go up. And the first place I started working, I lasted about a week and a half. I worked at ABC until my time as a vacation relief ran out. And then I went to NBC. And there I worked on everything. You know, it was great. The experience, it was just one. I did soap operas. I did late night TV. I did promos out the wazoo, you know, just churning I mean, them what out. did you think of yours? Like, that's such a big deal job. Well, that so many people even today were like aspire to, you know, what's a one in a million kind of thing. I was very, very you. happy for the opportunity, but also yeah. I was so busy. You don't you really have, time you don't to, have time to pat you yourself have time on the to back. Celebrate you know, yourself. And, I mean, it was, and and then <laughs> my wife was up there in the studio with every celebrity in television, <laughs> and I'm still basically in the machine room okay. making the television look good. Okay. You know, but uh, so, but then when we left there, and that was my my doing hold that thought we're going to take a quick break for these messages we'll be back okay with chuck o'brien this is film talk weekly (laughs) i'm your guest host castle cersei with the santa fe international film festival well i get yeah i do have one piece of advice i'll wait we'll We'll just do it now oh okay well the main thing is just get in there one way or another get a job and your next job is you the job you're on is the audition for your next job. And if you do anything well, people speak well of you, you get another one, you get another one. And hopefully you get, you know, to somewhere where somebody puts you on something that has more visibility. In it. But just keep going and never do less than your best. I met people that would say, oh, yeah, well, you know, when I get to New York, I'll do, you know, I'll really do it. Or, you know, when mm-hmm. I'm on the West Coast, I'll do it or this or that. But, you know. Don't ever do less than your best. And and because your peers are your judge and your peers give you your next job mm-hmm. because that, you know, even if they I just agree. say to a director, oh, I know a great guy on color correction or this or that. Mm-hmm. That's how it moves. And that's how it goes. Yeah. Be somebody and, that yeah. people want so to work with. Loving your job yeah. is very important mm-hmm. and, 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 and working from your heart. But, you know, don't don't slack off because there's. You know, as you say, so many people that would like to be doing what you're doing. Yes. Even if even when you're doing um, educational stuff for a high school or something, you know, anything that film is very a lot of your friends are thinking, oh, I wish I got that job. Right. And so just do real well and then and keep going. And that's really the the main thing to do. Um, And depending on whether you're in production or in engineering or whatever, keep up with everything. Know what's going on. Don't just know your own facility. Know what everybody else is doing, how they're doing it. Um, I'm talking again if we're on the show. We used to play a thing when I was at Avid where they, the game called Stump Shuck, where they could show me anything that was on TV or anything like that and say, how did they do that? And I could tell them how they did it. Uh huh. Can you do that today? No. Okay. Uh, I, I, it, it bothers me that I can't, but it's gotten so far ahead of me. And I got to the point where I said, no, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to, because I was a poet and a philosopher working as an engineer. Yeah. You know, and, and so I was way outside of my natural interest, but I did have a love of the business mm-hmm. at first. You seem like a natural. <laughs> yeah. You seem like a, you were a natural for that. Um, I did very well. I, I had I did have the capacity to learn. Like when I did the CMX, I learned it like almost overnight. Mm-hmm. And it was a very complex. It was a thick book. Are we back on to this? Yeah, we're on. Okay. The the woman yeah. that wrote the manual for CMX editing became a friend of mine. Her name was uh Candy. Uh Candy Chestnut. Chestnut. Which what? sounded like she <laughs> she performed, you know, on the bar, but um, she she was a very very intelligent woman, mm-hmm. and, uh, and was right there from the very beginning of Sam X. And she wrote their their manual and everything like that, but it it was thick, and there was a lot to learn. So I had an aptitude for operating equipment, um, understanding mm-hmm. the engineering behind it, not so much. Oh, uh, here's a quick story. Okay. Okay. Uh, two things. When I was at ABC, unions, especially at ABC, was really a, a father-son union, okay. and they really protected everything. And so um, when I first got to ABC and I was working down in the tape room, this guy comes over to me who was the shop steward, and he says, what do you think you're doing? I said, well, I'm, I'm rolling the commercials into tonight's shows. And he says, 
we don't do it that fast here. You know? Right. <laughs> because the faster you do it, the less you're people they need. Look, the, you know, yeah, you're making so it got, look bad. And yeah. then the first time mm-hmm. I went up to edit CMX uh, at ABC, somebody thought I was management. And as soon as they saw me, they leaned in and they said, you're on report. You know, so because managers couldn't even touch a button, you know, because okay. it was union, you know, and so uh-huh. it was very, you know, and I worked union for a long time and then I became the manager of the unions. And I think okay. unions are very necessary, but they should have sunset laws because they become more oppressive than the management they're protecting you from. So if they dissolved periodically and had to reform, they'd be interesting, they'd be less like upper management because mm-hmm. they become like the bosses when i would go to union meetings they wouldn't even let you talk they told you what you thought mm-hmm. and what you had to do. so there's a you know there's two sides to right. flip everything right. so but anyway uh but the union is also a lot of benefits what from. shows did you work on well uh i did um 2020 wide world of sports i can't remember the name of one of the uh daytime soaps when they went and did remote. This is where Chuck's pretending he wasn't watching the soap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he no, knows exactly were, what happened and all the stars. And, but if you're in the network also, you do a lot of promos because you'll notice, you know, tonight that you do a 30, a 15, a five, you know, a version of everything. And also there's a lot of matcha. Like when we would do the promos for the evening news, the last one coming in, we had to wait till about, Five minutes before evening news just to do the thing. And so we to get the material, we would get it, and then we would quickly roll it, and then we'd have it ready, throw the remote switch so that the control room could have it. And we used to like to see how close you could get to the deadline of getting, you know, so if you could get within 10 seconds of, you know, so, so that you knew that in problem, the control room, it's right? that feed, you know, yeah. and, and so we had a lot of fun uh-huh. with that kind of thing. So, you know. But uh, you do a lot of promos, and, and uh, but you know the West Coast did the dramas, and the East Coast did the news and the sports and the commercials, okay. and worked on a lot of commercials. And then you know when I left NBC, I did a lot of commercials. We had in those days they had all these boutiques in New York where people, you know, one of them that's still there is uh, uh, very much is Broadway Video, which uh, you know was um, Lauren yeah Lauren Michaels and Paul Simon. Mm. Um, and, and you know, but that that they're just so it was really cool because you, but then you'd have a limited number of clients, but be working on a very popular show at the time because that's why they're in there and they're paying all that mm-hmm. money. They're making a lot of money. So you worked for NBC. I worked for ABC. Then NBC. I worked for. We left New York. I've had enough of New York. Okay, why? It wasn't feeding my soul. Okay. It, it, Entertain my eyes. I, I learned photography yeah. there. I went out and photographed the entire city of New York in between yes, my shifts. I've, I've seen and, one and, of your photography yeah, shows. And there's not a human being yes. in any of them. I love that. <laughs> I, that's what I, I like love framing about it. Yeah. So that's when I finally had enough. So anyway, we went to Atlanta, but Eileen discovered that there was a new editing thing coming out called Avid. And she told me about it. And I went and interviewed and they, they loved me. And so I became one of the first people on Avid to market Avid all over the country. And so for a number of years, well, first all over the country. But then Avid, you know, everywhere, it's always with me, you know, if if you're really conscientious, you maybe don't want to get in the industry because people are always (laughs) compromising and and doing unethical things. And when we started at Avid, we were so inspired. You couldn't make us go home by beating us with a stick. Uh Everybody was so inspired. Ultimately, after two hours, because they were having so much success, they, you know, and I would give, I would speak before large groups, auditoriums full of groups, and I get standing ovations. So you had to learn it first. Yeah, I, well, I learned, but when, what I did, my job was to communicate it yeah. way out so they could understand it and like that. And so I would talk. So I left Avid and went to this new up and coming company called IMEX. And the IMEX. difference, IMEX. I M N I X. Okay. Right. Sort of like the IMAX uh, film, but it was IMAX. Okay. And IMAX was started by the people that had made the switchers, the Grass Valley switchers. Oh. And so, whereas on Avid, you could do one edit and anything else you did, you had to render. IMAX could do unlimited number of things all at the same time because they sent their video through 
a switcher to rather than having to composite it onto the tape. It's all very technical. Yes. But they were so they scared Avid to death. And and because Avid told me to lie, I said, okay, well, I'm gonna go over to IMAX. And when I got to IMAX, I said I would like to open the international office. And so after a short period of time, I got I mean and I got to move to Europe and we lived on the Riviera. And because you could get in and out of the airport in the Riviera to Geneva or Paris or wherever you need to go anywhere in the world. And I went everywhere in the world. I was never in a country more than three days. And I would go out and I'd just go country, country, country. And I Exciting. loved it, loved it, loved yes. it. You know, it was just fabulous. And Eileen was very, uh, you know, she, you just can't hold her back. You know what? She she said, can film festival. And she got herself. Some, you know what? We're going to have another episode with we'll you, talk about the two of you and Eileen I, telling I like that because so she tells is, the story this much is to be continued. Yeah, I I'm just throwing facts. I out. wanted to have Eileen talk, yeah. you talk, and then you're gonna both talk together. Well, yeah. Well um I'll, I'll pretend I'm talking. <laughs> okay. Well you'll be listening and right. we'll be and, talking. And I, yeah. Um so Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for asking me. I know you have a million. The most I've ever talked, I do. You might hear them in your co-interview with Eileen. Um, If not, maybe we can do a to be continued, you know, and hear. I will become the uh, Chuck and Eileen interview show. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, You guys can. Really, you know, proving once again, people, that you don't really have to do anything spectacular to be on television anymore. (laughs) Well, there's, you know, our show is about, there's all different aspects of working in film and television there are, there are. and there's probably something for everyone 